of Reed. She has been in the ELT industry for over 30 years. She has been a teacher, a teacher trainer. She is an absolute expert. She's an award-winning material writer. And she also um, she was also the president of IETFO. She wrote for us some magnificent series, the Wheels series, that I strongly encourage you to go and have a look at if you don't know it. And she's going to be talking to us today about the role of praise in teaching children. So over to you, Carol. Thank you so, so much. Okay, thank you, Federica, for that lovely introduction. And lovely to see so many of you from countries all over the world. It really is incredible how webinars like this bring us um, all together. And my topic with you this afternoon, as Federica said, is praise. And just to start off with, I would like you to um, imagine that you have you have a, a friend coming round for dinner, and that is um, pandemic restrictions permitting. And you've been teaching all day, you've got no time to go shopping. And so you boil some spaghetti, you open and heat a jar of bolognese sauce, you add some grated cheese from a packet, and perhaps if you have them, a few basil leaves to make it look authentic. And your friend says to you, this is wonderful. What a great cook you are. So how does that make you feel? Well, it makes you feel good. It makes you feel pleased. But then perhaps you begin to think, well, I've managed to fool my friend that I'm a good cook, but have I really? It may also make you feel that either your friend doesn't know very much about cookery or that he or she is being ironic, insincere, or even manipulative. What do they really want? So actually, among parents and educators, praise is often automatically considered to be a good thing in terms of developing children's motivation and self-esteem. But actually, there's more to praise than meets the eye. And this is really what this webinar is about. And in this webinar, we will explore we will explore we will explore i don't know why my slides were frozen there okay we're going to explore anyway um the pitfalls of praise in other words the hidden or unexpected difficulties and dangers of praise we're going to look at how to give praise to build up self-esteem. Ah, oh, this is happening again. This is what happened to me once before. How to give praise to build up children's self-esteem. We're also going to have a look at the influence of mindsets. We're going to have a look at how to use praise to foster pro-social behavior. And since it varies the way we use praise with younger and older children. We're going to look at praise as a continuum from preschool to lower secondary. And towards the end, I want to pull things together and give you my top tips for um, using praise. So praise can make children feel good about themselves. And that is so important to their motivation, well-being and self-esteem. But praise is also a double-edged sword and can produce other feelings as well. We're going to start with a quiz on praise and inner feelings. I'm going to show you eight typical examples of children receiving praise. And I'd like you to comment, single words, comments, any ideas that occur to you, on the range of inner feelings not necessarily just positive, that praise can produce. And you can just put your ideas in the chat box. But before we start, I would like you to switch on your cultural filters, okay? As the language of praise and attitudes towards praise may be different in your cultural context. You need to... Um, Bear, bear, in, bear in mind individual differences in ways children respond to praise. 
the relationships between praiser and praise and things such as tone or voice and eye contact and intonation, which obviously make a huge difference. So let's start then with my first example. Okay, the first example. And this is the child, a child draws a picture, but doesn't actually spend much time or effort on it. And the teacher says, that's a lovely picture. What a great artist you are. So how do you think the child feels? Flattered? Yes, probably. Feel good factor? Yes. But possibly also a creeping feeling that the teacher is either not being completely honest or even worse, doesn't know what makes a great picture. And this makes the child doubt the praiser or think, I can fool her. I don't have to make any effort. Yeah, exactly. Loss of trust. Fantastic. Doesn't, doesn't really care. And also notice here, it's actually being judgmental and labeling a child. And even though that label is positive, as we'll see later, this can lead to a fixed mindset. So what about this next example then? What about this next example? And the teacher says to a child about to have a spelling test, I know you're good at spelling. You always do well in spelling tests. Well, how do you think the child feels with that? Well, putting pressure, absolutely. And it can also lead to immediate denial. No, I'm not good at spelling. No, I don't always do well. And it can also create anxiety. Will I live up to expectations? Will I be good at spelling this time? And another thing about this kind of praise is that it emphasizes the omniscience of the teacher's knowledge. It's the teacher who knows rather than the child. And the teacher is giving credit to what they know rather than to the achievement of the child. What about this next example? Okay, the teacher praises everything a child does. That's brilliant, wonderful, great, fantastic. How do you feel? She feels good. Ha ha ha, yeah, okay. Well, the danger there, of course, is that so much praise like that is that it overly expecting, absolutely unrealistic, fantastic. And it may also become meaningless. On the other hand, with very young children learning English for the first time, we need to remember the importance of this kind of instant feedback and encouragement when they produce language. And I'm sure you find yourself doing it naturally, instinctively, especially if you've you know, been a parent. Van Leer, in his book, Interaction in the Language Classroom, he actually talks about the value of praise to encourage participation, particularly with younger learners. And even though the typical IRF model, you know, initiation, response, feedback of questions in the classroom, for example, what color is the duck? Yellow, very good. That closes down communication, particularly with older learners, but if you're talking three-year-olds and they say yellow, yes, you're going to say lovely, very good. So that also, this example begins to show the difference in the way we use praise at different um, ages. Let's have a look at the next example now, that the child puts an effort into writing an essay and the teacher says, that's a very good piece of work. Okay. And, but actually doesn't explain why. And this can lead to insecurity. Um, does he or she really mean it? What made her say it? Will he say it next time? And this kind of praise can create a dependence on the teacher giving praise for a child to actually know their own worth. Let's have a look, an empty phrase, exactly. That's a very good point in the chat box there. Let's have a look at another example now, number five. And the teacher says, I didn't think you'd pass the test, but you did. That's fantastic. So 
Oh, that's simply awful. <laughs> that's interesting comment there. Because exactly here the teacher is focusing on the child's weakness, but the teacher's praise shows that her view and on the of the child and their ability to progress hasn't actually changed. So this kind of praise on a weakness or vulnerable area may actually interfere with future performance as the child knows that the teacher doesn't really think she's likely to do well and this undermines their self-confidence and may affect their performance. Okay, so let's move on to another one now. You're such a talented writer. You should write a post for the school blog. So here, what do we have? We have the teacher showing excessive enthusiasm and also like the first one I showed you, um, the teacher is labeling the child and actually in a piece of praise like this, the teacher probably wants that blog post <laughs> for the school blog and it's actually a little bit um, manipulative. So let's have a look at um, the last one now that and this is one that I'm sure we've all said in our time. I know I've said it to my children. Well done. I'm so proud of you. But of course, what is happening here is the actual, the emphasis of the praise has shifted from what the child has achieved to the teacher's pride. So actually, it's about the teacher rather than the child. And so it might be better to reframe it um, as something like, you can really feel proud of yourself in order to build up the child's internal motivation and pride. So I think always praise for effort, absolutely. You're, you're anticipating where we're going. Okay, so I think as these examples show, as well as a feel-good factor, praise can produce other feelings as well. And that this is something we need to be aware of and very careful of. For example, it can produce doubt about the praiser. It can produce anxiety, insecurity, or even denial. It can produce a feeling that it's meaningless. It can also produce a feeling that you're being manipulated. And it can possibly produce interference with your performance and make you feel shaky and lacking in confidence rather than the opposite. Praise can also produce a dependence on approval to know your own worth. And at times, you can, it can produce a feeling that it's more about the praiser than what has been achieved. And so over time, if we're not careful and monitor the praise we give and are self-aware about it, praise can have a potentially negative impact. In fact, praise can be a kind of tyranny because when you praise children and you say simply, very good, fantastic, you're a wonderful writer, a great artist, you are passing judgment. And living with constant judgment can be a tyranny for children. As although praise may be given positively by teachers, it can be taken away at any time. You're good today, but you may be bad tomorrow. This kind of praise is often conditional. It implicitly says, I'll give you my attention and support when you please me, meet my criteria and standards and jump through my hoops. And it's also often about the praiser's knowledge. I knew you could do this. I know you can do the other. And the effect of this, very often unwittingly by the teacher, is to create dependency and a vicious cycle with um, a culture of praise junkies. Junkies, addicts. In other words, children who need constant affirmation from others to feel confident in their own abilities. Children who are addicted to getting praise from the teacher and always need someone else to judge and evaluate what they've done rather than 
developing the inner confidence and autonomy to be able to do it themselves. And this kind of praise creates a dependency on others for children to know their own worth. It can create huge insecurity and it can frequently last into adulthood too. So in order to counter this and break the vicious circle or make sure it never happens in the first place, we need to use praise in a way that allows children to build up their own positive self-beliefs and self-esteem. And it has been said that parents hold the key to children's self-esteem, but teachers hold a spare one. And as teachers, we have a very significant role in developing children's self-esteem and the five components of self-esteem based on the work of Robert Reisner back in 1982 and the way we use praise contributes to all of these. So those five components, a sense of security, okay, the child knows they are safe, a sense of identity, the child knows who they are, a sense of belonging, the child knows that they are included in the group, a sense of purpose, that they know why they are doing things, and a sense of personal competence, that they know that they can do it. So all those components of self-esteem, and this is really important in the way that we can contribute to this because children are still building their self-image from the significant people around them. The significant others, the psychological term, the really close and important people in their lives, including teachers, act as a mirror. And if responses from significant others and from their environment are positive, children will learn to value themselves positively. And if responses are negative, children will learn to value themselves negatively. And the teacher, we as teachers, have a crucial role as a mirror through which children discover who they are, creating conditions which are either conducive or detrimental to self-esteem. And as we know from basic psychology, positive self-esteem and the opinion children have of themselves is the single most important influence on their social, psychological, emotional and cognitive development, their motivation, their attitudes and behavior. As this quotation from Nathaniel Brandon um, shows, and I think I'll just read this because it is just so important. And he says, there is no value judgment more important to a person, no factor more important in their psychological development and motivation than the estimate they pass on themselves. The nature of a person's self-evaluation has profound effects on their thinking processes, emotions, desires, values, and goals. It is the most, the single most significant key to their behavior. And I think that is really underpins um, everything that we're talking about here. So the question becomes, how can we give praise in a way that mirrors back and helps children over time become self-reliant in the estimate they pass on themselves rather than always reliant on the teacher. And this is where I think we need to have a look at the difference between evaluative or judgmental praise and descriptive or process praise. So in evaluative or judgmental praise, the teacher says things like, you're a good boy, you're a good girl, you're an excellent student, that's fantastic, brilliant, wonderful, you're a great writer. 
And when we use this kind of language without saying anything else, we're making a judgment that doesn't help the child discover anything new about themselves to add to their emotional self-esteem and self-knowledge bank. As we can see, as we'll see a bit later, this can also lead to a fixed mindset. And we can contrast this with descriptive or process praise. When we say things like, ah, very good, I noticed you only used English in the game. That's great, I see a carefully written paragraph with every word spelt correctly. So when we say this and are specific in describing what we notice, see or feel, we reflect back to the child significant things about themselves to add to their emotional self-esteem and self-knowledge bank. By noticing specific details about each child, we're showing that we care. We're also sharing our criteria about the things we value. And this helps us to build healthy, trusting, secure relationships with the children. The description is also powerful in allowing children to credit themselves. So the least helpful praise is evaluative praise, which can be a kind of tyranny, making the child anxious and dependent. Will she think I'm good, wonderful next time? Why did she say that? You know, where am I going with this? And the most helpful praise is descriptive or process praise that comes in three parts. The first part, the teacher recognizes and acknowledges what's been achieved. Secondly, the teacher describes what she notices, sees or feels. And thirdly, uh, the child, after hearing the description, is able to internalize information about themselves and use this to praise him or herself. So for example, I am a neat and careful writer. I am able to play a game using only English. So let's have a look at a concrete example about how this might work in practice. Here's a poem by a six-year-old English child. Okay, and I think I'll read the poem because it's quite difficult to, <laughs> to follow. And it's, the poem is called The Wind and it goes, swish, whistle, whistle, goes the wind, crunch, go the leaves, blustery weather, and all is quiet except shh, 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 the wind. Okay, so you can see in that poem that the, the child has clearly understood the structure of a poem and what a poem is, even though there are lots of mistakes and the spelling is quite Chaucerian, although actually probably pretty good spelling. If you've been following a phonics program, she's doing pretty well. But And in our response to children's work, it's always important to focus on children's meaning rather than language accuracy. And in fact, um, teachers are often much harder on second language learners for things like spelling than first language teachers are. So let's have a look at two possible ways for teachers, for the teacher to praise the poem. So the first way, evaluative praise. This is wonderful. You write really good poetry, Hannah. So obviously the child's going to feel really delighted about that. Um, but it, it focuses on talent. You write really good poetry on a talent, on a fixed characteristic, and may lead to a fixed mi mindset, as we'll see a bit later. And it can also lead to anxiety and doubt. The child might think, do I really write good poetry? Does she really mean it? 
Is she just saying that to be nice? Um, will I be able to live up to her expectations next time? And it also means that next time the child tries to write a poem, it will be more to try and please the teacher than for the intrinsic motivation of writing the poem. So let's contrast this with descriptive praise. And the teacher says, what a lovely poem, Hannah. I can really hear the wind. I can see you thought very carefully about which words to use to convey the wind. And then the teacher might ask the child, what words are those? And they're words like whistle, crunch, blustery, shh. So this kind of feedback gives the child information about what they can do to add to their um, emotional self-esteem and self-knowledge bank. This kind of praise helps to make children more aware and appreciative of their own strengths. And the child's response in their heads, you know, is to internalize and realize um, that their careful thought has led to writing a good poem. I can choose words carefully to go into a poem. I think I'd like to write another poem now. So this kind of praise makes the praise more powerful and it also helps to give the child internal motivation to make even more of an effort and write another poem and do even better, leading to a growth mindset. Okay, I've seen some, some comments going there. Well, you can ask me these questions after. Okay, because some of them are going a bit fast. And so actually in the chat box, and I've mentioned it a few times, the contrast between a fixed mindset and a growth and a growth mindset and I think at this stage in the webinar it's important for us actually to look at this now because I would really like to emphasize the importance of using praise to develop a growth mindset rather than a fixed mindset. Now I know this will be familiar to many of you um, and this comes from a whole series of research projects carried out by Carol Dweck, Professor of Psychology at Stanford University and various colleagues. And the most well-known book that many of you may have read is called Mindset. Um, and Carol Dweck and the team's research is essentially into the underpinnings of human motivation and how some people persevere after setbacks, why some children give up and why others who are actually no more skilled, keep on trying. And Dweck sees that one answer lies in people's beliefs about why they had failed. And these are very often implicitly built up and communicated by parents and teachers through the kind of praise they get. And Dweck sees that there are two general types of learners, helpless and mastery oriented. The helpless ones believe that intelligence is a fixed characteristic. You only have a fixed amount. And by contrast, the mastery-oriented children think intelligence can be developed through effort and hard work. So let's have a look how that works in terms of the kind of mindsets that we maybe unwittingly produce. In a fixed mindset, praise focuses on intelligence or talents. You're good at writing poetry. You're great at maths. What a wonderful writer. What a great artist you are. And praise like this, okay, okay it makes children feel good in the moment, but we're talking about kind of over time. And this kind of praise gives rise to children having an implicit belief that intelligence is innate or fixed, that it's just something you've got and you can't change. And with this kind of mindset, challenges, mistakes, and the need to make an effort are a threat to the ego. If children can't do something, 
they feel it's because they're not intelligent enough. Mistakes make them lose confidence because they show a lack of ability. And as a result, children reject effort and hard work because they feel powerless to change things. They have the implicit belief that if they have to work hard, it means they're not very clever and won't make a difference. And so they give up. So let's contrast this with a growth mindset. And as you'll notice, I put keywords in red so that you can see um, the, the, the way they contrast. So praise in a growth mindset, in developing a growth mindset, focuses on process and effort that children put into something. So I can see you thought very carefully about the words to use. And this develops an implicit belief that intelligence is malleable. Malleable, so something that can be changed and something that you have the power to change and develop through hard work. And in this kind of scenario, challenges and mistakes are energizing rather than intimidating because they offer opportunities to learn. And children feel empowered to learn and to overcome difficulties and improve and to make a greater effort. Because the thing is, because mistakes and failure stem from a lack of effort, not ability, they can be remedied by more effort. Now, there is a real danger that in pre-primary and primary, if children are always just praised for their intelligence, for being brilliant and talented, um, this may make them feel good in the moment, but over time, this leaves them vulnerable and defensive when work becomes more difficult later on. Very often, children coast through pre-primary and primary, getting lots of evaluative praise. And this gives them the idea that academic achievement with no or very little effort on their part means that they're clever or gifted. In other words, they have an implicit belief that their intelligence is fixed, something they've got or haven't got in more or little measure. And what happens as soon as things become more challenging they lose confidence and motivation because as they perceive it, if they have to make an effort, it's because they're not clever enough. And in order to save face and still seem clever, which is important to them, they may opt out and say, for example, that schoolwork is boring and pointless or become disruptive. And this is a pattern that we often see when children move from primary to secondary school and suddenly their motivation drops off and they're not so engaged and they, you know, then they're, 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 they're rejecting making an effort and they say it's boring and pointless. So I think as Carol Dweck's work shows, it's advisable not to praise intelligence or talents as such or use generic praise that suggests a stable feature or characteristic. You're brilliant at writing poetry. It's much better to use praise for the specific process a child uses to accomplish something. I can see you thought carefully about words to use in the poem. That's great. This fosters motivation and confidence by focusing children on the behavior and actions that lead to success. And such process praise or descriptive praise may involve things like commending effort, commending strategies that have been used, um, focused attention or persistence in the face of difficulty or willingness to take on challenges. And I think developing a growth mindset is actually so important and we can do it through the kind of descriptive praise we've been looking at. But let's have a look at three other examples 
of how to promote a growth mindset. And the first example is actually to do with us as teachers expressing positive views of challenges, efforts, and mistake. So for example, the blue speech bubble there, let's, let's talk about what was difficult today and what we learned from it. Let's just not hide what's difficult under the carpet. Let, let's talk about it. Let's, let's be full on about acknowledging it and, and addressing it and what we learn from it. The orange speech bubble there, this is hard, this is fun. Let's keep on trying and see if we can do it together. For example, a challenging puzzle. And so actually making that connection between something being difficult to being enjoyable, because sometimes there's a kind of culture of things are only enjoyable if they're easy, but actually things that are challenging are enjoyable and let's transmit that to our children. And the third one there in green, well done for correcting the mistake. What has it helped you learn? In other words, to actually have a positive view of mistakes and deliberately use language that gets children to see how mistakes contribute to their learning. Another thing that we can do to promote a growth mindset is to actually tell stories about achievements that result from hard work, whether we're talking about preschool or upper primary or fiction or legends or real history or myths. The point here is that learning, children learning the value of making an effort is not a tick box exercise. It's not something that you teach and children learn and we've done it. It's acquired slowly over time. And so what we need are, if we're doing it through stories, stories that convey the same message in age appropriate ways as children get older. So in these little images that I just put together to show that kind of development, you know, in the first two on the left, the top left one, uh, Mimi is learning to dance and she can't do it and she gets very frustrated and fed up. And then she gets some advice from two little birds. And in the end, she can dance um, as well as her brother. And the little story below about two children practicing for a school show, the recorder and the piano. And they get fed up with practicing and their parents are encouraging them. And eventually, the practice pays off. So for older children in the middle column there, we've got the legend, the Robert the Bruce, the Scottish legend and the spider. If at first you don't succeed, try, try, try again. And underneath that, the girl who dreams of being a professional footballer and how she achieves this. And then on the right there, you've got a couple of real historical figures and their stories. So uh, top right is Alan Turing, the famous code breaker, who was actually told off at school for spending far too much time doing maths puzzles and not concentrating on all subjects. And um, the lady underneath him is Josephine Cochrane, who was determined to develop a dishwasher, and I'm very glad she did. And um, she spent six years studying science and mechanics and learning to draw before her project was complete in 1896. So in other words, what we're doing is embedding the same messages um, in age appropriate ways as children get older. We can also, of course, um, sing songs or say rhymes that focus on hard work. Um, this example is at pre-primary, um, but the concept is appropriate for all ages. Um, the chorus, I can do it if I try, yes, 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 I, I, I. And we can also remind children of that when they're having to make an effort about something. But this actually works for all age groups. Um, and I've, in fact, even done it with a group of teachers. You know, we could sing, I can teach online, it's here to stay. I can teach online every day. I can do it if I try, and so on. Or a little rhyme, okay, that focuses on hard work. 
um, with thinking hats. Let's put on our thinking hats. Think, remember, guess. Let's put on our thinking hats and do our very best. So, I think we've seen how praise is a powerful tool to build up children's self-esteem and self-knowledge bank and establish healthy, trusting relationships and a growth mindset. And it can also be an important tool in managing children positively and fostering pro-social behaviour. And in this context, I would like to just talk briefly about the concept of strokes from Eric Bern way back in the last um, century, but still a very useful psychological concept that people need and seek the attention of others, whether positive or negative. And strokes are the recognition, responsiveness or attention that one person gives another person. And if a person lacks positive strokes, they will seek negative ones because anything is better than being ignored. So positive being praised, negative being told out off, but both is a way of getting attention. And children are constantly testing out, uh, implicitly, they're not doing this consciously, I mean unconsciously, which strategies and behaviour get them strokes, both positive and negative. And children who get few positive strokes at home or at school can actually become addicted to seeking out the wrong sort of strokes, of winding you up to get your attention. And this is not helped by the fact that according to research, teachers actually tend to give praise or positive strokes to work and effort and tell children off, give them negative strokes for behavior. And so what I think we need to do is to reframe the way that we use praise to foster pro-social behavior and to convey to children the things that we value in the classroom. And I'm going to share with you now, there are lots of strategies and I'm going to share with you five, I think it is. Okay. And the first one is a strategy that I learned absolutely years ago. So it's not rocket science or anything new, but it has served me in good stead for all the millions of years that I've been a teacher. And it's called CBG, and it stands for Catch Them Being Good. And the, the idea here is that actually as teachers, we spend a huge amount of time telling children off um, for not doing things right. And CBG, we turn it round and we take every opportunity to praise pro-social behaviour and acts when you see them. So this might be being on time, it might be sharing, it might be taking turns, being kind, cooperating with others, listening carefully, asking questions, following instructions, adhering to classroom norms and rules. And the same principle as earlier you describe what you see, feel, or notice. Because the praise communicates messages about what you value. Therefore, if you value pro-social behavior, it's important to praise this as much as you do work and effort. The next strategy is the five to one rule of thumb. And this is very much a rule of thumb. But the idea is that you should aim to give praise in the proportion of five to one. In other words, if you have to say something negative to a child or about a child, um, try and find ways to say positive things five more times. And obviously, um, the bottom line of this is that praise should never be fake or insincere. We're talking about real reasons, but actually, Children need praise. They need that positive 
affirmation from the adults around them. And so I always just like to think of that five to one, not literally, of course, but in terms of balance of the kind of feedback that we give children, remembering that mirror that we talked about um, earlier. The next point, um, praise early in a lesson. For example, you know, whether you're, this is whether you're teaching online or teaching face to face, you could make positive comments. Again, they must be genuine and sincere, maybe about homework, maybe about the work they did in the last lesson. And actually, it's very powerful in helping to preempt misbehavior and stop it um, building up and actually establish a feel good factor at the start of the class and include as many children as possible. And this is particularly important when you're working online because you want every child to feel that you've noticed what they're doing and they will feel a personal interest is being taken in them and it makes them feel positively disposed at the start of the lesson. The next strategy, peripheral praise, sometimes called proximity praise, and this is one um, actually for face-to-face -face classrooms, and it's to do with um, correcting inappropriate behavior by actually praising children who are doing it right. For example, if you've got all the class sitting, working very well, and one child who hasn't settled down and is disrupting things, the teacher's normal reaction is to go for that child and tell them off and try and make them, and actually ignore all the ones who are working well. In peripheral praise, the idea is that you move over to where the child is who is being disruptive is and acknowledge and recognize the way the other children are working well. And then you briefly look at the person who isn't complying and carry on. And actually, over time, that kind of praise gives the message, it's when I'm working well that I get the teacher's positive attention, not when I'm off task. The next um, strategy, positive compliment. And this, this can sometimes be very effective when a child knows fully well that they're behaving inappropriately, but you actually start off by acknowledging something that they've done well, you know, and David, you did really well in the vocabulary activity earlier, but I think you need to settle down to the next activity now. So David will be surprised and flattered to get the compliment before you focus on him not settling down now. And you're also doing this in a way that gives the responsibility to the child to take their own decision to settle down and get on with things now. And the last strategy I'm going to mention is by the way. And by the way, I call this by the way because it's good with older children. And you may say things like, by the way, great that you used English nearly all the time in the game. Thanks for putting up your hand, by the way. Well done for waiting your turn, by the way. And actually, what this, this does is it shows that you acknowledge and recognize appropriate behavior by the child and that you care about it, but you're not making a big um, deal about it. And a further element in descriptive praise for pro-social behavior is to deliberately use one or two words to sum up praiseworthy behavior. So for example, great you've got your book today, that's being organized. Great that you're on time today, that's being punctual. Great that you put the crayons away, I call that being tidy. And in this way, you tell a child something about themselves that they may not have known, a kind of verbal snapshot, which over time they can internalize. I'm organized, I'm punctual, I'm tidy. And from small descriptions like this, children learn what their strengths are. And this goes into their self-knowledge and self-esteem bank. And it also communicates things that you value in the classroom that go beyond children's work and performance in English. 
So some examples there then of pro-social behavior. And I think as that last one shows, the by the way strategy, that's obviously not something you'd use with very young children. And I think it's important for all of us to recognize the evolving role of praise as a continuum from preschool to lower secondary, well, and beyond, obviously. And in terms of age, let's see what the difference is, the key difference. We need to be really generous with praise with younger children. Up to the age of about seven or eight, children have an insatiable appetite for praise. The desire to please adults is a hugely important influence. And adult feedback provides guidance, encouragement, it gets children participating, it builds confidence, and children feel cared for and liked. And all of this is hugely important. And remember the mirror, it gives children information to develop their self-knowledge and their self-esteem. As children get older, however, you need to use praise more discriminatingly, more judiciously and sparingly. Praise for encouragement will be devalued, except with very young children. And it's important to look for things which really merit favorable comment. If you overuse praise, it becomes meaningless and will be like a you know water off a duck's back for children and it won't give them that that glow that um when it's really meant and specific and timely um that has that positive effect on their self-esteem and develops a growth mindset obviously of course we need to think about what to praise with different age groups our praise needs to be age appropriate with four-year-olds, for example, if we say, well done for finding the right page, that's fine and a real achievement, but would obviously be an insult for older learners. We also need to think about whether to praise in public or privately. With younger children, usually praise in front of others is fine and actually contributes to that feel-good factor and self-esteem. But with older children, you need to consider whether to praise publicly or in private. They may feel thoroughly uncomfortable being praised by the teacher in front of peers, not cool at all. That doesn't mean they don't need praise, but they need it in a different way. You also need to think about things like your voice. You know, an enthusiastic pitch may be fine with little ones. And actually, I think we do this instinctively and naturally as we do as a parent talking to small children you know to say fantastic lovely great but obviously that is going to seem patronizing and be resented by older children and with older children it's much better to use a much more neutral tone as if you're talking to adult adult to adult this is more effective and you're going to be taken more seriously another consideration is the language that you use for praise. Um, whether you're going to use English or the children's mother tongue or the shared classroom language. And I think, remember back to the three parts of praise. Usually it's best and you could to recognize and acknowledge the achievement in English. What a lovely poem, Hannah. But then it may be appropriate to say what you see, notice and feel in their own language, as that may be beyond their comprehension level in English, but it's nevertheless important to convey the message that you want to convey. And then as children go, grow older and get more competent in English, more and more of your praise, back, praise and feedback will be in English. Okay, so I'd like to um, pull things together now by actually sharing with you my um, top 10 tips for using praise. And I've made a PowerPoint patchwork for this, okay? And let's have a look at these now. And please, if you have any, um, if you have any other tips 
that you'd like me to add to my patchwork, please put them in the chat box because I'd love to hear. Okay, so my first tip is be spontaneous. Be natural and spontaneous about giving praise. Having unexpected praise is a lovely surprise and can have a motivating impact. And when you're spontaneous, you're also genuine and sincere. So be natural about it and be spontaneous. And being sincere leads to the next point, which is be sincere. Never, ever, ever be insincere or use fake praise. You know, children know it, they feel it, they read you, they, they, they know when your fake's not real. And even if you're using praise strategically, for example, as in the peripheral praise strategy we talked about, it still needs to be real praise. My next tip, focus on the process. So acknowledge and recognize what children have done, you know, great, fantastic, but then focus on praising children's efforts, actions, and the process they've gone through to achieve the outcome. When children are praised for their efforts, they learn over time to attribute the success to their efforts. And this leads to a growth mindset and recognition that the more they make an effort, the more successful they are likely to be. Next point, which relates to this, make praise specific. Remember those three verbs. Describe what you notice, see, or feel. This feeds into the child's self-esteem and self-knowledge bank of what they know about themselves and what they can do. And the other thing is, this also shows that you've paid close attention to their work and really care. If you just say something like wonderful, great, you may not have even considered it um, properly. The next tip, frame praise positively. And what I mean by this is highlight the behavior you want to encourage. For example, rather than saying, well done for not shouting out the answer, <laughs> which of course makes a child think about doing just that. You say, well done for waiting your turn. The next tip, keep yourself out of it. In other words, rather than I'm so proud of you, which is really about you, say you can really feel proud of yourself with that bit of work thereby encouraging children to internalize and build up their feelings of self-worth. Avoid praise such as, I knew you'd do well in the test. I'm sure you'll do better next time, which displays your omniscient knowledge and can create a dependence on you for children to know their own worth. And this also tends to foster extrinsic rather than intrinsic motivation. Children want to do better because they want to live up to what you say rather than because of the intrinsic value of learning. And sometimes praise may seem like you taking the credit for what has been achieved. And there's very, John Holt writes about this in his book, How Children Fail in the Last Century, and talking about the way, the way often when teachers praise children, actually what they're really saying is, aren't I a good teacher for having taught you to do this? So I think it's a try and keep yourself out of it as much as you can. The next um, tip, avoid labels. You're brilliant, you're a great light writer. Okay, these are positive labels um, and they will would get a feel good factor definitely. But the problem is that over time, if these become part of children's self beliefs, they may lead to a fixed mindset. So I'm a great writer, I've been told I'm a great writer. So actually I don't need to make a great effort. So you need to focus on their actions, efforts and persistence to achieve something rather than their fixed characteristics or talents. Next point, avoid comparisons with other children. 
sometimes without really meaning to, you might find yourself comparing a child and saying, well done, you know, you even did better than so-and-so. And even if that's private, it's very um, divisive and also may encourage children to think that winning and doing better than other children rather than learning is the goal. And the last tip, avoid overpraise. Okay, and I saw somebody putting that in the chat box much earlier as well. You know, overpraise it can set an unrealistically high standard, may create anxiety. How can it be achieved again? It can also lead to a fixed mindset, making children fearful of fa failure in the face of new challenges. And also, you don't need to praise every positive action. You know, the benefits disappear if children always expect it. Exaggerated praise may become meaningless or seem insincere. And even you might also cultivate feelings of superiority in children. But all these tips, remember also that you need to give frequent, encouraging feedback and support. Children need this all the time, not just when they do something praiseworthy. And particularly now, during these uncertain and difficult times of the pandemic, you know, that high five or digital praise postcard, I'm sure you've seen those online, you know, depending on whether you're online or face to face, to give children support and encouragement they need will never go amiss. And I think it's something that as parents and teachers, we do instinctively anyway. So looking back over what we've done in this webinar, We've explored the feelings praise can produce, not just positive. Um, we've looked at using praise to build up children's self-esteem and self-knowledge bank. We've looked at the influence of mindsets. We've looked at using praise to foster pro-social behavior. We've had a look at the evolving role of praise from preschool to lower secondary. And I've just shared with you now um, my top tips for using praise, just as the drilling noise comes, <laughs> comes on in the next door flat. I hope it's not disrupting you too much. So the final message of um, my webinar is this. Praise is powerful. Use it often use it with care. So that really brings me to the end of my webinar. And um, just to follow my own advice, um, I'd like to say thank you for participating so actively.